Welcome to Mr. Woods Teaches. I'm Fred Woods, ready to teach. Hi, welcome to Mr. Woods Teaches, and I want to talk with you about math anxiety. Don't panic! I want to start out with a quote from Joe Bowler, a professor of mathematics at Stanford University. Every time a student makes a mistake in math, they grow a synapse. Let's let that sink in for a moment. 17% of the people in the United States suffer from math anxiety. That's about 55 million people. Mathemophobia, you know, it probably started way back when with Archimedes, Ptolemy, or Pythagoras. You know, it, it's not something that uh, hasn't gone away. It's still present, and it's something that can be changed. Think about this. Myself included, I suffered from math anxiety from when I was in first grade all the way through fifth grade. Luckily, I had a math teacher from six, seven, and eight who took me under her wing and taught me in a different way. I'll come back to that. I want to dive into contributors to math anxiety. There's parents and caregivers, pop culture, as well as teachers and educators. Now, recently I saw posts about core mathematics that where somebody had a check and they had a 10 frame and they had some dots and circles and I'm going, wow, that's, that's like they don't want to understand it. And then I read some things recently and this is a closed mindset. The core math is just extra steps, if you ask me. Double the time, too. That stupid, multi-step, overcomplicated method for simple arithmetic problems is ridiculous. What that does is it gets transferred to your children or grandchildren or your siblings, and that can affect a child for life. It affected me for a long time as well because I heard st certain things like that. This new math is overcomplicated, and that was back in the early 70s. Let's listen to a growth mindset. If I can be reminded of the steps or formula, I can learn. That was from a parent. Only way you learn is by making mistakes. I'm going to come back to that here in a moment. So parents and caregivers, be positive. Learn something new. Take the time and interest in your child. They will appreciate and love you for that. Then there's pop culture. Revenge of the Nerds made mathematics look like it was just for nerds, for people who are different, or unlikable, or unattractive. But then again, there was Goodwill Hunting where you showed, you know, hip and cool and good looking people doing math. But there's not enough of that. We need to make it so that mathematics is not determined by what you look like or if you are involved with math or love it or, or if you're good at it. And then there's teachers and educators. They perpetuate math anxiety as well. They talk about people having math brains or um, over you know, saying, hey, you're doing what magnificent. You have a knack for this. And then when that student encounters something that's really tough and they fail, their math anxiety kicks in. My math anxiety was that I wasn't given enough time. I needed a little bit more time to process what was going on. I hated the speed test for multiplication tables. We were given two minutes to do 0 through 10, write it all out, and get it done. When I was able to speak it and was given it an ample time, I was able to perform well, but I was reprimanded for my slowness. Math is not something that it needs to be timed. We need to give children more time to do their math. Don't push them. Change is needed. You know, we need to change the myth about math brain and uh, talent. Now, I've never heard somebody say, well, I have a sociology brain, or I have an English literature brain. I heard people say, well, I have a math brain, or I don't have a math brain. I'm done in that math. That's a myth. Everyone has the ability to learn mathematics. It's been scientifically proven. I'm going to come back. What has changed? Well, there was this research done over multiple years, and that shows that math anxiety is learned. And to overcome it, they came up with what's called the Common Core Mathematics. And that was designed to make it so that mathematics is inclusive. It gives children different avenues to solve problems. I mean, if I hear something, I may not be able to understand it or uh, accomplish the, that goal or 
complete the mathematical problem. If I hear it and see it, my average goes up for completion. If I write C here, it goes up again. Now, if you add in different things like pictures, relationships to life, real world applications, let me give you an example. I was teaching an eighth grade math course. I was talking about slope. We were working on a coordinate plane and doing you know, y equals mx plus b. And I had half the class were interested in it. Um, a small percentage had already completed the work and they were working ahead on the warm-up problems. And then another percentage, they were just like going, I don't understand this. When I took it off the coordinate plane and I drew a picture of a house and then had a slope of the sewer line going out to the street, I had a kid raise his hand and said, that's what my dad does, he's a plumber. And it came in to where he had a connection to real world life. And actually he was able to understand slope better than some of the students who were considered the higher achievers. So let's not discount writing pictures or drawing pictures and writing things out differently um, because it's a different way to show math to enable students have a deeper understanding of what's going on. That's what we need. We need to create students who have a deeper understanding of what's, what math is about. Okay. Parents, neuroscience backed up that everyone can learn math. Look it up. There was this study in England about taxi cab drivers, and they took them, and here's these drivers. They, had me they have to memorize all these streets and side streets, and, and whether one's uh, one way or, or another, or both ways, and bi-directional. And they took them, and they taught them math. And so everyone has capable of doing math. Educators, please be encouraging. Let's, I'm going to I'm going to go over some of these things for encouragement rather than uh, um, praise. You know, we can praise to a certain extent, but let's not overdo it because that can give um, you know, some students a complex of superiority as well as other students a complex of inferiority. I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, let's take a look at a few things. I give up. The student says, I give up. Or a parent says, I give up. How about saying, hey, let's use strategies that you used, or what are other strategies that you can use to figure out the answer to the problem? I hear students say, I'm not good at math. Well, let's turn it around and say, what are you missing? Or maybe the student can say, what am I missing? Why, where, where, where is the, the gaps in my learning? We want to encourage them to find those gaps and, and fill in those pieces so that they're able to accomplish this math. I made a mistake. Well, it's been learned and scientifically proven that mistakes lead to learning and growth. And then finally, I can't do math. Well, you can do math. You need to say, I'm going to train my brain to do math. And that, that's what happens, is that you train your brain to do math. Be open to it. My parting words are that to be a math person, all you have to be is a person that does math. Like, share, and subscribe to Mr. Woods Teaches.